Armor, Part Two, Jack Crow. Chapter One. The only other humans in the cell had already passed through the dispenser, which was good. They couldn't afford to deal with their notions of justice and rights of life and the rest. Not that I disagreed with them necessarily, but now I just couldn't afford them. I got to the plate and stomped on it hard, holding my cone underneath the funnel. The purin slopped obscenely out, filling my cone and spattering me with dozens of little gray flecks, the same gray as the dispenser itself, the walls, the floor, the same color as me, covered with weeks and weeks of unwashed linsalt dust and rotten purin. I moved out of the line and sat down in a corner on my heels, with my back to the wall. Like I always did at dinner time, I scraped my hands clean as best I could with what was left of my fingernails. This time, like the last dozen or so times before, I knew it was useless. The layers were now too deep. The linsalt, the purin, the stinking filth of the place were winning. Like all the other poor dumb bastards in there, my skin was giving it up to the gray. But this time, it was different. This time, it was happening to me. I coughed, or snorted, and maybe I snarled. Then, I took a greasy lump of purin out of the cone with thumb and fingers and wedged it through my beard into my mouth, so I would at least appear normal. The dwarf was next, shuffling along warily between two lindril, almost hidden by their towering gauntness. Their great height, almost three meters, made him seem even shorter. Their featureless gray bony faces made his face, all fat nose and bobbing whiskers, seem even more animated. He became frightened as he neared the plate. His head twisted from side to side to cover all movements. His eyes darted pitifully about in their gray, dust-caked lids. He was a bundle of nerves as his cone was filled, so ready to bolt that the sound of the muddy stream erupting from the funnel made him jump. He should have been scared. In that netherworld of lindril giants and other madmen, he was the easy meat. And in prison, easy meat quickly goes. The dwarf's impossible attempts to see all sides at once increased after he had actually gotten the food. He stepped away from the plate and stood in the clear place beyond uncertainly, as if expecting an assault from everyone at once. But apparently, no one wanted to go to the trouble. Today had been a full day, and we were all too beat to care. All but me. I still watched the dwarf. I watched him gradually relax, begin to breathe again, and then I saw the greater weariness descend on him as he again remembered that he would have to go through it all once again in three more hours. With his customary shuffle, he moved around the corner to his usual niche to eat. With a last glance at the others for any signs of pursuit, I stood up, went around the same corner, and killed him by driving my gray boot through his gray face and into the softer gray beyond. Red blood. I gathered up his cone before much could spill out. I had saved most of my portion, only pretending to eat before, and I took them both together for the maximum effect. Almost immediately, I felt stronger. Purin will last three hours, and three hours only. But if you take more, say twice as much, you'll have six hours of strength for that time. Six hours of prison strength, that is, which was still only half as strong as I should normally feel. I shook my head. I had no time to enjoy. There was more to it. From its hook on the underway, I took the slab spike. Before, I could never have lifted it. Even now, it was heavy. Carrying it across my shoulders, I stalked away through the dust. G had caught his foot pad in the belt that morning and would still be weak. Weak he was, but still no fool. He spotted the red glow to my eyes from the near double portion of Purin the instant I appeared. He stuck a paw pad against the wall and reared up to his full lindral height. 
Even in that din chamber, his stature was awesome. Two steps closer, and he recognized me. You! He had time to shout, before I swung the full weight of the slab spike down atop his archplate. G's eye cubes lost the glint of amused disgust they had held when first seeing an assault from a puny human. They became instantly opaque from the lindral pain response. He screamed that terrible scream. He clawed frantically at his foot pad, lost his balance, and fell against the wall. I was already on him, scrambling along his length, lunging forward. His throat was wide open, gasping for air. I wedged the barbed end of the slab spike deep into the passage, felt it lodge tightly. I bounced to my feet and threw my entire weight against the free end of the pike. The cartilage warped, split, then ripped. The screams peaked, ceased. Even with what G had already eaten, there was still twice as much remaining as I was accustomed to. My eyes blazed crimson through the settling dust cloud. Those who had come to watch faded quickly out of sight as the glow and my strength increased. Another pure rage is on, they thought, and nobody wanted to be next. They were wrong. I was in no purin fugue to kill blindly and gorge myself until dead or ruptured inside. I was going out. The salt bore clamps gave easily to my newfound strength. But then I had trouble with the treads. Those few moments of futile fumbling drove me into such a rage that I finally grabbed up the salt bore itself, my drill bit and casing respectively, and threw it across the cell against the belt mechanism. I shoved the drill bit deep into the machinery, braced myself with feet and back, and keyed the power. Sparks flew, metal shrieked, grinding against itself. The belt drivers began to buckle as the salt bore tore into its center. The wall shuddered, then the floor. My back felt like it was breaking from the force of the salt bore torquing against it. Something, probably my back, had to give. But I couldn't let go. I might never have another chance, another day, another life. My skin is turning gray! I shouted at the top of my lungs, just as the belt drive and the supporting wall erupted. The salt bore casing saved me, shielding me from the flying debris. I shoved my way through the wreckage, hot metal infused lint salt, and I was out. The brightness of the sun of any sun, was a searing blow. It blinded me, staggered me. I almost didn't see the lumbering guard. Almost. Guards were twice human size with shell hides like rhinos and looked just like what they were designed to be. Invincible. But they had stalks for their eyes. And I leaped up between those trunk-sized arms, planted my knees on his chest, and grabbing a stalk in each grimy fist, yanked backward with all my might. They popped neatly out. The guard swayed, tripped, righted itself. Those arms clamped around my back like falling girders as the third stalk, undismayed by the streaming stumps on either side, swung toward me. I bit it. I plunged my teeth into it. I shook my head from side to side. I think I screamed. The eye ripped loose. The guard fell, fortunately, backward. I disengaged myself from underneath its heavy paws and ran, and ran and ran, tears streaming with relief. I was not only out, I was free. Ahead, at the port, the ship was there. It was, after all. The sounds I heard from deep within the mine were not, as I had feared, only the product of desperate fantasies. I had to stop once. The taste of the bile that the guards used for blood made me heave and heave again. But I was up and running again before my stomach had emptied completely out. I was out. I was free. It was a ship. It was Borglin's ship.